but I'll tell you something, Chris, if we see, uh, uh, you know, even a, a strong portion of, uh, you know, the, these contracts stand for delivery, the question, you know, beckons where, where do the 100 or 200 million ounces of silver come from? Hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. As we continue on in, well, I guess it's the end of the trading week when this is airing. Uh, it is time for Saturday night's physical silver and gold market update with Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin, who's tracking the physical side of the market away from all that COMEX paper nonsense where people actually buy or sell physical precious metals. So. Andy, welcome on into your weekly appearance. How's everything going with you today? It's going good, my friend. I hope it's going well with you too, Chris. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, well, it's amazing. We're coming towards the end of the year, which means that we are also nearing the COMEX Silver December delivery cycle, which some people are expecting could be a significant event. I don't know, I think to some degree, the longer this goes on and there's so much leverage in these markets, uh, I guess it potentially makes something more likely, but what are you seeing there? Well, I, I see the potential for a lot of volatility over the next six days. There's six trading days left. I mean, I, I, being that today is Wednesday, when we're having this discussion and the day is just about over, there's five trading days left with an, with an open interest of over 70,000 contracts, Chris. That's, that's um, uh, what, 350 million ounces of silver. That's almost 20% of the worldwide known thousand bar inventory. Uh, you know, there's supposedly somewhere in the neighborhood of 6 billion ounces on the planet of which 2,000 are known to be in 1,000 ounce good delivery investment bars. You're talking nearly 20% of that standing for open interest. Now, you know, normally that wouldn't be such a big deal. Um, in the years that I've been doing this, those kinds of numbers wouldn't uh, inspire the fear in, in uh, the commercial bank's heart in the respect that it, it's only been this year that we've seen the rise of the other category, the sovereign wealth funds and the family offices and the very, very wealthy people, whomever they are, that are standing for delivery. Now, I'm not expecting to see 70,000 contracts stand for delivery uh, in five days, but what I do expect to happen is a tremendous amount of volatility heading into that first delivery day or the end of the contract. They're gonna try to shake loose as many people as they can. Uh, but I'll tell you something, Chris, if we see, uh, uh, you know, even a, a strong portion of, uh, you know, the, these contracts stand for delivery, the question, you know, beckons where, where do the 100 or 200 million ounces of silver come from? So anyways, I'm expecting it to be a wild ride. I'd say uh, buckle up and hold on for some volatility heading into the next five days. Yeah, that makes sense. Although while we've seen historic record setting numbers in terms of the deliveries. It seems like no metal is actually leaving the building yet. So what is, when you talk about the COMEX deliveries, I guess what specifically does that mean or imply and what can people take away from what they're seeing there? Well, I think it's just being, it's, it's being put into a category that isn't being offered any longer. I'm waiting for it to be pulled out of the building and quite frankly, uh, you know, I, I don't know um, just how much has been pulled out of the building, but what I do know is that it's being gobbled up and, and taken off of the exchange, whether it's out of the building or not. It's taken off of the exchange and it is being put into strong hands uh, leading into, uh, you know, or, or as a result of each and every one of these delivery contracts. So I would expect at some point that we'll see this metal actually leave the building and I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of it has left the building. Quite frankly, I'm not sure how much truth that we can find in much of what comes out of the CME, uh, but I will tell you that I think what it really signifies is more of the same thing that we've been seeing for a very long time and that is uh, big money has been pulling their money, whether it be off of the exchange physically 
like the central banks had done, pulling their gold out of the Bank of England and the New York Fed, or in this case, preemptively pulling it into accounts where that metal is no longer being offered as registered. Um, and uh, I think I got that term right, uh, where eligible is actually in the accounts of the uh, of the of the banks, and eligible is for the uh, what is is offered on the exchange. I think I got that right, or vice versa. I'm not an expert in the COMEX, but what I will tell you is simply this: when you see massive, massive open interest, and every single month we see these big entities classified as the others standing for delivery, whether they have actually pulled it out of the facilities or not, it is no longer uh, eligible to be offered on the COMEX exchange. It's just one step away from being pulled out of the building, uh, which would really put an exclamation point on it. But they are standing for delivery and letting the, instead of letting the contract uh, just expire or roll over. And that's really the big difference in all of this. And so I guess you know, I, I think it, it probably is scaring the commercial banks quite a bit because it used to be they could make it short with impunity without having to worry about entities standing for delivery, requesting that that metal uh, actually be transferred to their account. And that's what we're seeing right now, Chris. So, yeah, I think it would certainly put an exclamation point if we had validation that it was leaving the building. But but nonetheless, it, it certainly is a challenge to the commercial bank and to their shorting, and uh, we're seeing some people stand up to it. Whether they actually pull it out of the system or not completely and totally, I guess we'll have to wait and see. But they're certainly just only one small step away from that. Yeah, and especially given how I believe the U.S. Mint actually has, uh, I think it's Bix has mentioned, a congressional mandate that they have to produce the silver um uh, perhaps maybe they should take some delivery i know they run out of silver or stop production perhaps you could put the exact correct words on why every couple times a year we hear is the mint has stopped making the eagles and any updates on where things stand with them well quite frankly uh the the mint has typically been the model of inefficiency as we and the, the calendar year, typically it's right around this time that that happens. Um, you know, as far as what the Mint is actually doing right now, I will tell you that, and quite, quite honestly, that there's a decent supply. They have caught up. Typically, we see them run out of supply right around this time. I was listening to an interview today where, you know, the, the, the narrative is that the Mint has produced tons and tons of coins uh, uh, for circulation, dimes, quarters, pennies, nickels, et cetera, and gold and silver, but that it is being held up in the Mint, that the distribution is not happening. Now, um, I don't know if that's on purpose or not. Uh, maybe the Mint is trying to stuff the coffers of, uh, 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 you know, for a specific entity. I mean, this is something that I've thought about for a long time, which kind of leads me down a little bit of a rabbit hole. And it's simply this. When we talk about the fine that JP Morgan was given, the, the slap on the wrist, the $920 million fine and only being charged with spoofing, which in and of itself was, I don't know, I think certainly uh, not reflective of, of the damage that they have caused. It just further, further makes me believe that the stockpiling of the metal that JP Morgan supposedly has done, perhaps the hoarding of the metal that the US Mint is doing uh, is for an entity. Who, which entity? Uh, either the US government or the Chinese government. Maybe the US government is trying to restock their strategic silver stockpile. It just seems to defy logic how when we see 1.2 billion ounces dumped on the market last Monday. When we see all sorts of manipulation that is done, and by the way, that's, that's one and a half times global mine supply. Uh, it, just, it just reeks that, that the manipulation is being done for a reason, that they're trying to hold the price down. And if you listen, if you listen closely enough to what is being said out there, you're beginning to see a run on thousand ounce bars. You're beginning to see a run on kilo bars. You're beginning to see uh, requests for delivery, standing for delivery. You're beginning to see 
that big money is positioning themselves using the manipulated paper price to accumulate. And if we take a look at the lack of uh, a, a severity in the fines, it just makes me believe more and more and more that this is being done for someone, either the U.S. government or the Chinese government. There's just so much evidence out there that these markets are being controlled for a reason. And when you see the price drop, uh, when, when you see over 400 million ounces of silver being delivered into the ETFs, supposedly, uh, in just a couple of weeks this year, uh, should have driven the price straight to the moon, um, but it hasn't. The price is being controlled so that people, someone, some entity or entities are able to accumulate vast quantities of physical. That's what they've been doing for a very long time. They have been misdirecting. So whether the product is leaving the building from the others, uh, whether an entity is accumulating the metal, whether the U.S. Mint is hoarding the metal, as some are saying, and all of these things are somewhat supposition, but I'll just tell you that when you put them all together and try to draw a line going all the way back to the central banks pulling their gold home from the Bank of England and the New York Fed and work your way forward to all of the developments we've seen for the last several years, culminating with the type of action we're seeing on the COMEX, it just, it just reeks of big money repositioning themselves ahead of this supposed reset that we see coming. And no matter how it plays out, no matter what anyone would say to me, I do believe that is what is happening. The big money is getting ahead of the little money. They are positioning themselves quietly and they are using the price, the manipulated price as the ultimate tool of misdirection and allowing them to corner the physical market. When you hear that the kilo bars in Europe are a six-month delay coming out of Switzerland. When you hear that Standard Chartered Bank is buying up all the 1,000-ounce bars and the Chinese are buying up all the 1,000-ounce bars from the Swiss refiners, we're just one step away from seeing it here in the retail industry, which surprisingly right now is still fairly stocked. Uh, but as you mentioned, when the U.S. Mint runs out of product, as they have repetitively done for the last decade, Within a week, typically, it follows suit with every single other source of supply. And it happens year in and year out. And when it happened in March, it happened in a period of a less than a week or two, everything disappeared. Premiums went to the moon. Product delivery delays were extreme. And that's why you have to get in front of it and look at a pullback like we saw on Monday. And a, a unexplained, unjustified smashing uh, where so much is dumped on the market at the open to create an effect, you have to use that as a subsidy. You have to trust your gut, trust your, 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 your studying and your positioning, and use it as a subsidy to increase your position. That, I can guarantee you, is what the big money is doing. Yeah, I would imagine so. I don't know. It's what Chris was doing this week, fortunately, so... Uh, it was nice to go on a little shopping spree. And uh, so from that standpoint, again, it's been nice changing my own mindset to say, all right, you know, I think the price is going to go higher, but it's lower than uh, at least good if you have funds to invest. Although, Andy, you mentioned COVID, the, the mint, and how all these things fit together. I keep hearing headlines, Europe's shutting this down, this state's shutting that down, and Again, I'm by far not an expert on what governments are going to do in response to COVID. But, I mean, again, I, I say just in the sense that we saw the Mint has several times blamed a, a shutdown or some delay or glitch on COVID. Is it safe to say there's an increased probability that, especially if there is further shutdown, I mean, that the, the Mint situation is a bit of a fragile one to begin with? and you know, I'm not trying to lead people astray or create a certain impression, but just I, I think about all these factors. And to me, as a student of probability, it's somewhat greater than, you know, a year ago when it didn't even exist. Well, that, that's just the thing. And it, it's really a good question. And it's kind of 
dynamic in and of itself, Chris, in the respect that, you know, you got to look at it from the position of the big wholesalers and companies like mine who, who spend millions and millions and millions of dollars acquiring supply, right? So we have to acquire supply. We have to factor in the, the premium, the demand that we see in the industry is a function of the premium, the big wholesalers, the mints, the refineries, the, the public who is not letting go of their metal for anything other than a higher premium than we're used to seeing. And, and, and premiums still are higher than I've ever seen with the exception of what we saw earlier this year. In general, premiums are, are certainly much, much higher. But, you know, the, the, the thing of it is, is, is that um, I think that what you'll, what you'll notice is the dealers have to make a decision because they can't hedge the uh, premium. They can only hedge the metal exposure. And yet, you know, I was saying all year long that I, I bought everything that wasn't nailed down leading into the election. So I'm pretty well flushed because for whatever reason, there has been a period of time where, uh, you know, for the last couple of months where you would think the price would have gone parabolic. It hasn't. It's been managed. No question about it. Certainly an attempt to keep it below its 50-day moving ad- average seems very apparent to me. And that has somewhat dampened demand, physical demand. Uh, but, but what you have to understand is that the dealers all use the environment that they are in to gauge, should I take more risk myself as a company? Should I go out and buy a whole bunch more supply? Uh, uh, or do I work under the premise that we've always worked under where it's an industry that is somewhat just in time? In other words, well, if I don't have, you know, right now I happen to have north of 50 or 60,000 Silver Eagles in stock, 2020s, that I just made a concerted effort to buy as many as I could, but at what point, uh, if all of a sudden we sold all of those, and I make the assumption that I'm able to get more, do I go in and buy more? But what happens if the mints shut down? So what I'm getting at as it pertains to your question, which is a good one, is that if we see more lockdowns, this is an industry that is incredibly supply chain driven. There are two mints in the United States that are major, the U- or I mean, in North America, rather, the U.S. and the Canadian mint, and a couple of refineries. Everything else comes from across the Atlantic Ocean, whether it be Australia, Austria, U.K., South Africa, you name it. Uh, it all comes through supply chain channels. And when we see a gumming up of the supply chain, if we see like we saw earlier in the year, of all the silver mines across the globe shut down. The refiners shut down. Um, The mints shut down. All of a sudden, best intentions can be thrown out the window. So when I normally can just call up the U.S. mint and order more, or the Canadian mint, or the South African mint, or the Austrian mint, overnight you can see supply chains just shut down. And when that happens, Uh, you end up with a situation where you're out of luck because all of the business that we've done this year, record volume for every precious metals company uh, has been void of people selling completely and totally one out of every few hundred are people selling. It's all people buying to protect themselves from a myriad of things from the debasement of the currency, to social unrest to whatever they see coming. But the problem is nobody is selling. There's virtually nothing in the way of, secondary market. And if, to accentuate your question, we see supply chain disruptions, it's the end of the ability to get product. Last March, when this happened, I had uh, over $2 million worth of orders placed between the U.S. and the Canadian Mint when they both shut down. I had no way to get that product, which had been paid for, in the, in the case of the Canadian Mint, for over six weeks. The U.S. Mint was a little bit quicker, but The really case in point is you have to secure your position before that happens. It's easy for me to say, but I mean it uh, completely and totally. This is a market, as Rick Rule is fond of saying, that has a total total of a half a percent attributed to one half of one percent attributed to uh, the the. Uh, port- the overall portfolio of, of the American investor, one half of 1%. So when you see greater interest from hedge funds and from 
people like Warren Buffett and uh, the Ohio police and fire, when you see a increased exposure to it, when you see big money talking about it, very, very, very quickly, you could see uh, an increase in demand. And if, if we saw just a revision to the, uh, the last 30 year mean of about 2%, you're talking a fourfold increase in demand in a market that overnight would run out of product because of that. And then if we couple into the, the uh, mix into the, the factor uh, of, of uh, supply chain disruptions, uh, it's, it's game over. And so these are things that sound like uh, I'm just trying to be sensationalistic, but I'm not, not even in the, in the slightest. This happened just a few months ago. It's happened repetitively. And I think what's different this time about most other times is there's a growing awareness from a l much, much, much larger cross-section of the country into protecting themselves in, in ways that most people would consider unconventional. You and your listeners and myself wouldn't, but a lot of people who have know nothing other than stocks and mutual funds and, and bonds look at precious metals as a very unconventional approach until this year. And I think you're seeing an awakening. I would call 2020, in my viewpoint, the great awakening, not the great reset. There's a great awakening by so many people, which very, very quickly changes the entire landscape, Chris. And I think that's, to me, has always been a big issue. I've been saying for a long time that I thought the inability to source product readily would define this market before it's all said and done. And I, you know, I don't think it's over yet. I think we will see that. If we see, as an example, more social unrest, more lockdowns, the governor here in Minneapolis just locked down, uh, just stopped all um, youth sports and all bars and restaurants, again, closed for the next six weeks. You can, you can get uh, food to go, no dining in, everything is locked down again. If we see this on a more broad-based um, national, um, type of, of action, yeah, I think very quickly you could see huge supply chain disruptions and, um, and, and really a difficult time trying to secure product. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess it's late November, so at least if you're in Minnesota, I, I hear it's getting pretty cold there now anyway. So, uh, yeah, it's really a drag. Well, it's come super, visit it's me really in Austin, drag. man. I'm working on my tan by the day, so get on down here, brother. And in fact, my main takeaway from what you just said, I mean, we're a lot of great things, although I was just mesmerized thinking about how your long uh, silver, silver premium, you're just massively long it. But fortunately, at a time where all of the conditions that caused one of the greatest spikes in the silver premiums in history, I think it's safe to say earlier this year, um, you know, it's like buying fire insurance when the house is already on fire. Um, wow, I wish we could trade derivatives on your option premium bet. Mm, that would be glorious. It, 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 it's really a hard thing because a lot of the product that I bought was at higher premiums. And as the competition and, and as, as the wholesalers lower the premiums, you know, we have no choice but to, to eat that. And that's a dilemma that the industry faces in terms of securing more product. And so that's why it's always on a razor's edge. If you see Mint shut down, the, the dealers are naked exposed to premium. And so, you know, a, a, a prime example of that, real quick, Chris, just to underscore for your listeners, in 2007 and eight, uh, the price of gold was about $1,000. And right before Obama took office, the threat of confiscation was so huge that the numismatic gold market uh, exploded, and you would see common date mint state 62 St. Gaudens selling for a six or seven hundred dollar premium to a thousand dollar gold price. So, I flew all around the country telling my clients to sell their 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 St. Gaudens and buy gold bullion uh, because that premium could certainly couldn't last, and and it really hasn't. It was the best call I ever made. But the point is, is that in that environment, you were getting seventy percent bid on a 62 or three grade double eagle. And right now that bid may be three or four or 5%. So the, the premium is a function of the, the, the narrative, a function of supply and demand at that any given moment. And I think most people listening to this would agree that 
this year, so many things have happened so quickly that just blow everybody's mind that nothing surprises me any longer. And so when I tell you it would be a, a, a very quick event where product would just disappear, uh, it, it happens. If you see something that incites the public to protect themselves, and we see more and more mainstream participation, as we've seen all year, the dealers run out of supply. If you then couple that with lockdowns and supply chain disruptions, there really is nowhere to go because the reason they say there's no market like a bull market in precious metals is that the higher the price goes reinforces your fear. The fear is what is why people are buying precious metals. They're not buying it to get rich. They're buying it to protect themselves against what they see coming. And a higher price in metal will only reinforce that concern. So no one is selling to go back into dollars. So when we talk about supply chain disruptions, potential higher premiums, difficulty getting product, yeah, it may not be that way now, but it can change really, really quickly. And over my career, which is now 30 years long, I've seen it dozens of times in normal times, uh, let alone in the midst of a pandemic with shutdowns and massive social discord and a dichotomy between red and blue and a, an election that is being disputed and all of these things that are creating a discourse or a narrative where, yeah, that could happen very, very, very quickly. And people who are waiting for a pullback will get shut out because every single time in this environment, or anything like this environment where there's a modicum of demand and, uh, and you see the price drop, people are waiting for it. That's when you see all the product disappear. Just like we saw in March, the price fell to 12 bucks an ounce. You couldn't find an ounce anywhere in this country for under 20 bucks. That's kind of the point is that, well, okay, so at 20 bucks, do I load up on supply with $12 spot? Uh, that's the question the dealers will have to face. And that's how, why you'll find gaps in supply because the dealers sell out and then they have to decide, well, should I spend a whole bunch of premium on buying stuff when it could change? Or is it going to go higher? Is it going to go lower? Can't hedge it? Don't know. So in some respects, companies like mine are in the same boat with the people who are buying the metal from us in the respect that we're all really, uh, uh, you know, uh, passengers in in what's happening in, in, in terms of premium. The, the market will dictate the premium and you will get that premium when you sell. That's another important thing too, Chris. If, you know, the few people who want to sell into this market, you'll get higher premiums than I've ever offered anyone. It goes both ways. So anyways, I, what I'm trying to really get across here is just trying to be uh, come across as sincere. I think the premium thing and the inability to source product in a blink of an eye are two things that I personally am very concerned about. Whether or not listeners need to be is, is, a, is another question altogether, but I do believe it will be to some degree a defining characteristic of this market into 2021, that's for sure. Well, I mean, no need to be concerned because <clears throat> obviously you can call me where I'll be keeping an eye Ironically, uh, I'm kind of serious when I actually say this, I'm going to keep an eye on the toilet paper market because <laughs> you know, it's like if you, see, if you see people get concerned enough that they're making a run on Costco toilet paper, I don't know, that's the best indication I could think of that. If I see a run on Costco toilet paper, I'm going to get long, well, I'm already long silver, but maybe I'll, ooh, I could buy premium, hedge it, so I'll just be long the premium. Um, so it'll be fun to see how it happens. I'm excited. I think people are getting excited. Uh, fortunately, it's been a good year overall. Silver, hey, at least we're over 20 bucks. And uh, the Fed seemingly going to guarantee that it keeps going whenever that happens. So Andy, as we wrap up, uh, for folks that are interested in buying or selling physical precious metals, can you let them know what's the best way to do that? And, and if you can get them a good price and uh, all this other stuff. Absolutely. So, well, first of all, we are, every week we like to offer your listeners a special. And for this coming week, we will offer the um, uh, Vienna, Austria Vienna Philharmonic. And that will be uh, in any quantity for your listeners $3.29 over the price of silver in any quantity. 
anyone that would like to take advantage of that special uh, Arcadia at Miles Franklin. And um, uh, we would be more than happy to offer that special over the weekend or through the following week to your listeners. And uh, of course, as always, a portion of anything that we do goes back to your efforts because it's people like you that are getting real information out to the public. It's very disheartening to me. And this election has been really, Chris, to me, one of the most disheartening things of this entire experience, this election has been the lack of information, the, the, the lack of information coming from the mainstream media, which creates such a perception of reality for half of the country, over half of the country, that creates this dichotomy, this separation, this angst. Uh, and it's for people like you that speak the truth, that get the information out there that, uh, honestly, uh, I'm, I'm most appreciative and most concerned about when several of the people who, who interview me from time to time have their their websites and their YouTube channels taken down uh, in, in, in a censorship sort of way when information is not given to the public that they need to hear on so many levels, whether it be you know, political or economic or just the misinformation, disinformation and lack of truth is very troubling to me. And that's why I'm so honored to, to be part of this, to be your friend, to have a, a relationship with you and just to be part of getting the truth out there and um, at least a sincere version of it, the best that I can. So anyways, my appreciation to you and uh, always looking forward to next week. I'm sure there'll be lots that uh, happens over the next week, enough for us to talk about for sure for 10, 15 minutes. Yeah, man, we're like the vaccine to the Keynesian, Rothschildian mentality indoctrination, which uh, I know, uh, you know, people are concerned about COVID, the low inflation and everything else out there. But uh, that's what that we're, we're like a, a condom against Keynesian economics. Keep yourself clean, kids. You don't want to catch that one. So, Andy, I appreciate you <laughs> here as always. We will continue spreading the word. And folks at home, again, uh, Arcadia at Miles Franklin, if you'd like info or to buy or sell metals. And uh, just as a sweetener on the deal, if you want to hear what Dave Pranzler of Investment Research Dynamics is expecting in the metals for the rest of 2020 with only a couple weeks to go, it's coming your way now.